Hi everybody, welcome to another Spectrum Economics video. Today we're going to be looking at controlled opposition. So this falls a little bit in line with what I've been talking about with game theory. So again, there's a little bit of gaming in terms of this and I think it's a topic that many people are interested in. Controlled opposition, how is it done, how is it played? Some people think it's a little bit of conspiracy stuff. Trust me, it isn't. There's plenty of examples of controlled opposition in the world, whether it be businesses or whether it be sports or whether it be governments and politics and all of that sort of stuff. So we're going to be covering off on a few of those things in today's video. Okay, so what is controlled opposition? So basically that is controlling both sides of the game, or depending on how many opponents they are, but it's having control over the key players, so you're able to manipulate the outcome. And there could be many reasons behind that. And one is you want a certain outcome to happen, but it's very difficult to get that outcome if you only have one side of control. So you need to be able to manipulate your opponents one way or another. And a lot of that people think, oh, it's done illegally with match fixing and all that, bribing players, you know, to throw games and, and that sort of stuff. But it can be a lot more complicated than that as well. And it appears in many, you know, many aspects. And, and it also appears in, in the business side of things. And some of this is done within plain sight. And some of it, you can find out about it, but it's not initially that obvious. All right, but well, let's talk about what we've got here, wrestling. People know about that, it's sports entertainment, and the results are more or less controlled, and that is because it's, it's entertainment. The objective of having these matches and competitions and all that is to entertain the fans, and that is the, the main focus. It's not so much about determining who is the better fighter. You probably want to watch something like UFC or things along those sides, or what is it, mixed martial arts and things like that for that thing. But the focus is about putting on a good show. And I believe wrestlers are generally rewarded for putting on the big shows, putting on the great shows, and they get title bouts to that sort of thing, rather than necessarily, you know, being the best at pummeling an opponent, but best at actually entertaining the fans one way or another, whether it be on the mic or whether it's actually doing some very fancy moves in the ring. So that's something I think a lot of us know about, but what we don't know so much about is the business side and especially the politics side. And some people get, you know, a bit funny on how that works, but it's actually very, very obvious, especially in politics, how it works. And that's especially done when you have a two-party system. And many countries seem to have that. It's very, very common in the Western world to have a two-party system where it's one or the other bouncing backwards and forwards. And uh, it seems almost bizarrely strange that you go with one and then you go to another and you go with one and it's 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 a little bit different than the business side but I'll get onto that in a minute so what have we got with the businesses for example so you notice there's a lot of very large companies and sometimes we don't even know exactly how large they are because some of their branding is a little bit hidden under other names as well through mergers takeovers and all that stuff you have these huge companies that actually own most things, most everything, and almost in many, many areas. Now, like, take Google, for example, you talk about the internet. Google is, is a more or less fairly obvious one. They tend to put their name on a lot of stuff, and to their credit, I think they, they want to keep that branding out there. You have a few other things in there, like you have, what is it, Blogger, and you have Android and YouTube, and, but people are mostly aware that that is Google, and they connect in there. There's no real secrets around that. Like with YouTube, you have the Google Plus and all that sort of thing. So it's fairly open, but Google is a massive, massive company and owns a lot. If you're going through the internet, chances are you're gonna be encountering Google, whether it be a search engine or whatever, you know? Google is huge and I think not think they're hiding that. That's made that fairly obvious, but they are, like I said, they are still controlling opposition, though they have made it very open. Another company you can talk about is Walt Disney. And they're somewhat open, some of it many people don't necessarily know about. Like, did you know that ABC, uh, ESPN, Marvel Studios, all those things, that they all come under Disney? So that they're all Disney companies, though Disney, like Google, they tend to put their names on a lot of things. And even with the, the most recent Marvel films that have come out, you've got the, the, um, the Disney logo on there. Some of them you don't necessarily know about, I, I wouldn't have known about. Uh, ABC, for example, and so I just, you know, looked it up and all. So it's, it's a little bit obvious, but again, they're controlling the opposition, and it's again within that media field, in the entertainment areas and all of that, that they have that control, and it can control the news and control 
what these different agencies are saying because it's all within the one system. But again, a lot of people kind of know about that. This is where we look at um, other companies as well, especially within media. It really comes down to, what was it, six companies? I looked at it, it's quite interesting, really. So we've got companies like News Corp, and they are what, Fox, Wall Street Journal, New York Post, Disney, I mentioned with ABC, ESPN, Pixar, Marvel Studios, Viacom, got MTV and uh, Paramount Pictures, Time Warner, it's a big one with CNN, Time Warner Brothers, CBS, Showtime, NFL.com, Jeopardy 60 Minutes. So those six companies pretty much control everything. And it's quite interesting that they are sort of creating competition, but it's not real competition because you've got it in, they are controlling those aspects. So you think you've got a really big choice. In reality, you don't because these big companies are actually controlling everything. How about something like Pepsi? Again, what, what does Pepsi own? They own a lot of different companies. Many people don't know that they, they're not just in the drinks area. No, they got the potato chips and the crisps. They got cereals and all of that that comes under Pepsi. So it's not just your Pepsi drinks and your other drinks that are somewhat like Mountain Dew. I think they've got a little Pepsi little logo on there somewhere on the bottles. But it's not necessarily promoted as, as Pepsi in itself. Many people think of Pepsi as in Pepsi Cola, the drink. But Pepsi, the company, actually has a lot of other companies under there. So they're keeping the control within various areas. Another one, interesting one is uh, Carnival, Carnival Cruise Lines. So many of you may have traveled there. I've been on Carnival. I think it's, it's a really good company. Well, the main company anywhere that I go with the Carnival. I was on the Carnival Vista in um, Europe back in uh, 2016. It's a brand new ship and it was great, but there's actually a lot of other companies under Carnival and it appears you have a choice. You can go with uh, like Pino Cruises or you could go with Costa. And they're all serving little different niches within the cruise line industry. They're not necessarily directly competing with each other and they focus on different things and so not necessarily fighting over revenue. But it does give you the illusion when you go on your cruise that you have some real choices. But again, it's, it's manipulated within the system and they're pushed into this various niches in order to maximize your revenue and your profits for, for your company, for, for Carnival in this case, being such a large company and with so many other companies actually under them. It's quite amazing that chances are you go on a cruise ship, you're actually under Carnival, even if you haven't gone on an actual Carnival ship itself. Because I think Carnival, in their own ships, they've got a slightly different focus than some of these other ones, so they didn't want to have that competition. And you can see from this diagram here, you'd be actually quite amazed that so many big corporations own all these other corporations in themselves are actually fairly big. And what have you got? You've got Johnson & Johnson, you've got Nestle, you've got what's that, p and you've got Kraft, Coca-Cola, Kellogg's, and like Kellogg's, I think mean, they, they own so many different cereals. Then they're not hiding it though, you've got the Kellogg's brand on all of those as well. Like I said, some of them make it less obvious than others. So how about politics in terms of government? Do we have something similar? I'd say it's very similar in a way. As I mentioned with the two party system, you've got two parties that are very, very similar, but they kind of portray themselves as being different because they have debates on certain things, but all of these debates are controlled and are on issues that in the end don't make a huge difference. And if they do debate things that could potentially make quite a bit of difference, then they tend to go back on what they say. And what you end up is with very, very similar governments, regardless of which party you select. And it's very clever because people think they're choosing. They think, oh, we can have this, oh, we can have that. But you don't, you end up with the same thing. And that's the whole point. And by having controlled opposition, you, you actually have less resistance. And in fact, it's something that's celebrated this whole, you know, this whole massive shenanigan of, of what we call elections and stuff. And it's, it's no bigger than it is in America. It's all the fanfare, the celebrations, the parties, all this whole big democracy, wonderful story and all, all of that. And it's the entertainment. And we've got a big entertainer with Donald Trump. And a lot of people like a lot of things he says. It looks like he's very, very different from the, uh, the Democrats. In fact, the way he's been betrayed, he's very, very different from the Republicans as well, which I think has got him a lot of votes. But You've got to remember all of this, in the end, is, is an act. And I think with Donald Trump, they pushed it a little bit further in the sense that 
he actually really does look like he's quite different. But when we come down to seeing the various changes and issues, we're going to encounter very similar things. So, so what does that leave us then? So, in a sense, you have two, a two-party system fighting over very small issues and all that, and then resultantly not making a huge difference. And that, like I said, that is good. And, well, it's good for them because you have a higher power above those two parties, and that higher power gets in no matter what. And by keeping them very, very similar, it keeps the same goals and objectives. And you look through a lot of uh, presidencies or a lot of governments and, and all, a lot of it amounts to the same. A lot of debates don't happen that should happen. And I've got that in another video uh, that actually covers off on a lot of issues that are not even talked about. And only a certain few issues are highlighted and fought quite aggressively on to create the illusion that there is something different. So why do we want to create that illusion in the sense that it's not, you, you get the re reduction in um, resistance, which is fair enough, but you also provide a little bit of flexibility as well that I haven't really touched on so far. So, for example, you're pushing one direction very hard one party, but you realise maybe you need to put the brakes on and go in a slightly different direction and how you're going to get things done because certain things aren't working. You could switch to the alternative party, push them aside, get the alternative party, number two party, and they can make those changes because, after all, they are the opposition. Am I right? They are the opposition, and it doesn't look like you're going back on anything. So you can still keep the same goals, but you can adjust the strategies by bringing in different different parties that are supposedly going in different directions, but you can try different things to achieve the same thing. So it, it actually puts you in a stronger position because you've got a, a party that's trying to achieve something and they fail and they've got to go in another direction. There's going to be a lot of confidence lost in them and that gives opposition a chance to come in. But if you have your own opposition to come in and fill that gap, then those same objectives and goals can still be reached. And also, by having that, it keeps the ultimate power still remains with the very few, as we want to call them the one percenters or the bankers. A lot of people say it's the banks run this, run governments and run countries, which a lot of ways that is true. You know, whoever controls the money has an enormous amount of power and also the big companies as well. And you can keep that power there by reducing resistance. And that is actually quite critical to the success of using controlled opposition in politics. So I've got this in another presentation, but this just quickly gives us an idea of where we sit in the scheme of things. So you can see we're right there at the bottom of what we call the, uh, the then and now corporate feudalism, I think we got. So we're there at the bottom and we've got our elected officials and they're more or less accountable to people higher up in the scheme, people we don't uh, vote on. And people could argue this is a bit of conspiracy, but look at the central banks. Who controls the central banks? It's not the government, it's not the people. It's the other way around. They control the government and they control the people through the government because the money supply, it's created independently. It's not created by the governments or by the people. And by having the money gives you the power. And then we end up caught in the debt trap, as I like to call it. And here's a, a very good statement by um, John Adams here. And this is about in terms of conquering people. There are two ways to conquer and enslave a nation. One is by the sword. Well, that's what's been done for what, thousands of years. And it's one of those things that's initially successful. You can go in and conquer through military force. You can hold them for so long, but people will fight back and they will, they will eventually gain back their countries. And we see this time and time again as empires have crumbled. So the other alternative is by debt. And debt is a very powerful way of enslaving someone. If someone always needs to repay something, they always have to keep working, always have to keep the jobs, always got to keep the nine to five, can never get out of that endless cycle because they've got to keep paying more and more money because they owe money. And okay, you could say, well, you know, they don't have to overspend. There's certain things that keep you locked in, like high electricity prices, for example, or you can have high rates or utilities and all of that keeps you locked in. And of course, the biggest one of all is the mortgage. You either rent, which I was in renting for years. It's not a great experience to be subject to a landlord and inspections and all of that. Or you could have 
your own home, which isn't really your own home because you've got a mortgage on it. It's actually owned by the banks. You've got to keep paying them, even though interest rates may not sound high at the moment. But over time, that's a lot of money that's coming out and you've got to keep paying it again and again and again. And how do you get the money to keep paying for it? You're keeping your job, your nine to five, and that keeps you busy and that keeps you with an enslavement. Anyway, that's something for another day. I've got another video on that, but I still thought it's worth raising in this video. Okay, let's move away from politics onto something a little bit more lighthearted now in terms of sports, like I mentioned with wrestling. And they say about wrestling not being real and all that. It's possibly you could argue that it actually is one of the more real sports out there, funny enough, than some of the other sports because they've been more or less open about what their objectives are and that's to entertain. It's World Wrestling Entertainment. Their objective is to entertain, not so much that they're competing to actually be physically the best wrestlers in the ring, but you've got more of the, the entertainment factor. And I think that is, is achieved rather than some of the other sports where it's portrayed that it's all about the best teams winning and all that, and not so much about the ratings, which, well, unfortunately, it just isn't true. And like we look at the National Football League, and many people are going to say, whoa, calm down, yeah? Wait a minute, yeah, National Football League, of course it's teams playing each other. How could they not be? There's so many people involved. But you'd be surprised that it's actually a lot easier to manipulate than you think. And basically because of the complexity of the game, there's so many different things, like so many different types of penalties that can be called. And holding penalties is a very interesting one. Now, that can be called on almost any player, it's, it's believed anyway. And just a couple of holding penalties, maybe all it takes is to completely turn a game. You break a team's momentum, and it's, and it's a lot about momentum. The sport is a lot about that. And as you saw the most recent Super Bowl with the, um, what was it, the Patriots coming back against the Falcons, so some of the things that happened in that, it makes you wonder like, wow, were these really such bad decisions that are so inconsistent? But it's necessary for the entertainment factor. And if you look at it in terms of entertainment, and yeah, it was a really entertaining game. I don't think it would have naturally occurred that way because the chances of that actually happening it's highly, highly unlikely. But they needed the entertainment factor given that they were losing viewership. People were moving away from the NFL. So like I say, you have the controlled opposition. It may not necessarily because you're looking for a particular outcome, but you're actually, in terms of result-wise, like Patriots winning it, I think believe that was probably what was the plan. But I think the bigger outcome was to have a very entertaining match. I think that was what was the key. And to keep viewers interested, and that is the goal, to keep people coming back to, the, to this and having that high entertainment value. And that was particularly the case in the Super Bowl because of the way it played out and the way it ended. And we see many other Super Bowls and big games that have ended under somewhat controversial circumstances, but at the same time have been very, very entertaining games as well. So it's become kind of like wrestling, sort of sports entertainment. I know a lot of football fans don't like it. I'm a big fan of the NFL itself. I enjoy all of it, but I'm not going to necessarily kid myself in saying that, you know, that it all occurs naturally and there's no scripting in that, or there's no controlled opposition. All right, that takes me to the end of this video on controlled opposition. Um, if you liked it, uh, click the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, uh, click the subscribe button. I've got a number of series running. I've got my conference series. I've also got, um, what's that, another series? Oh yeah, my vegan economics series that is still going. And I've got some economics basic concepts still going as well. If you want to know more about some of the basic stuff that you could be interested in. But anyway, thank you for watching and uh, I'll be seeing you soon.